Okay, good evening. Um, welcome to the 11th um, event in the Rescue in Budapest, Roll Wallenberg Commemorative, uh, Commemorative Program Series. Um, a lecture entitled Diplomatic Rescuers of Budapest, Carl Lutz, uh, Friedrich Born, Giorgio Proleska, and Monsignor Angelo Rota, uh, presented by uh, Dr. Um, Mordechai Paldiel. Uh, my name is Steve Shapiro. I'm electronic resources librarian uh, here at the Sprague Library and the coordinator of the uh, program series. Uh, I'd also like to mention our um, Dr. Marina Cunningham, executive director of the Global Education Center, uh, who's the co-coordinator, um, and her assistant director, um, Wendy uh, Gilbert-Simone. Uh, both of them have done a uh, fantastic job uh, help, helping me put this together. Um, and I want to also thank you for coming to tonight's uh, lecture, and uh, I hope to see you at some of our future events. Uh, we have uh, program brochures in the back if you'd like to uh, browse them and see, um, take a look at some of the events that we're having uh, this month uh, and in December. Uh, at the end of the, uh, the lecture, I'd appreciate it if you could fill out one of the audience survey forms uh, that will be passed out um, uh, by one of our students. The Rescue in Budapest Commemorative Program Series is organized by Montclair State University's Global Education Center, Harry A. Sprague Library, College of the Arts, College of Humanities and Social Sciences, School of Communication and Media, the Film Forum, WMSC Radio, Jewish American Studies Program, Montclair Hillel, the Office of Equity and Diversity, uh, and Holocaust Genocide and Human Rights Education Project. Uh, additional support has been provided by the Hungary Initiatives Foundation, the Holocaust Council of Greater Metro West, Congregation, Congregation B'nai Keshet of Montclair, uh, Temple Nair Tamid of Bloomfield, the Consulate General of Sweden of New York, uh, and Montclair Public Library. Tonight's speaker is Dr. Mordechai Paldil, a lecturer at Yeshiva University and Turo College who teaches classes on the Holocaust and rescue, as well as the history of Zionism and modern European history. He's also a consultant at the International Raoul Wallenberg Foundation. From 1982 to 2007, he headed the Righteous Among the Nations uh, Department at Yad Vashem. He and his staff were responsible for honoring non-Jews who rescued Jews from the Nazis and their collaborators during the Holocaust. Dr. Paldiel was born in Antwerp, Belgium, but his family fled to France uh, during World War II. They were able to evade the Nazis and escape to Switzerland with the help of a French uh, priest, Simon Gallet, who was honored by Yad Vashem as a righteous Gentile. Dr. Paldiel is a well-known scholar in his field and has published a variety of works related to rescue and rescuers during the Holocaust. Some of his books include The Path of the Righteous, Gentile Rescuers of Jews During the Holocaust, Sheltering the Jews, Stories of Holocaust Rescuers, Saving the Jews, Amazing Stories of Men and Women Who Defied the Final Solution, and Diplomat Heroes of the Holocaust. He has been invited to speak about the Holocaust and rescuers on numerous occasions in the United States, Israel, and Europe. Dr. Paldiel was the keynote speaker at the UN annual Holocaust commemoration ceremony on January 25, 2013. As an undergraduate, Dr. Paldiel studied economics and political science in Hebrew University uh, in Jerusalem, and he received his master's and doctoral degree in religion and Holocaust studies from Temple University in Philadelphia. Um, I just also want to point out that we're going to have a book signing at the end of this lecture, um, and that'll be in the, the back of the room. Um, so without any further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Ma Mordechai Paldio. Thank you. So my lecture tonight is going to be on uh, some diplomats that uh, we at Yad Vashem honored the, the righteous among the nations. Uh, Carl Lutz from Sweden, uh, Friedrich Vaughan from Switzerland, uh, Pascal from Italy, and 
and Angelo Rota, who from Italy too, but he represented the Vatican in Budapest, Angelo Rota. So let me begin. A little bit of background. The tragedy that befell Hungarian Jewry in 1944 came at a time when the tide of the war had turned definitely at Germany's disadvantage. It was merely a question of time before the Allies would vanquish Nazi Germany. Uh, but while lining up with Nazi Germany in a military alliance and introducing a series of anti-Semitic laws, Hungary consistently opposed German pressure to implement a Nazi-style final solution in its own land and continued to protect its 800,000 Jews, 800,000 Jews, which included approximately 75,000 persons who had converted to Christianity but were still regarded as Jews by the Nazi definition of the Nuremberg laws. And so it provided, uh, so Hungary did not implement the final solution in the way that we know took place in other places in Europe. When the Germans moved in militarily on March 19, 1944, most Hungarian Jews remember that date, March 19, 1944, when the German army took over. And it included a special commando under the leadership of SS Colonel Adolf Eichmann in charge, and he was in charge of implementing the final solution in Hungary. And that was a part of the Senate Hungarian jury with the full fury of uh, the Nazi uh, very oil murder machine. The Hungarian jury was not prepared for that. They had made no plans, no contingent plans, and Hungarian jury, they felt that with the war coming almost to an end, and the Russians uh, knocking at the doors of Hungary from the east, uh, nothing would happen to them, as well that the Hungarian government on the Miklos Horthy would not allow the Germans to touch the Hungarian Jews, except, you know, for anti-Semitic laws here and there, but not, not to destroy the Hungarian Jews. So when the Germans uh, came in, the, the flood of uh, anti-Jewish laws promulgated by the new Hungarian government descended on the Jewish community. It included the prohibition of ownership of telephones had to be turned in, radios, automobiles, and uh, the ch uh, change of residence was no longer allowed. All Jewish servants, civil servants, and lawyers uh, were dismissed, <coughs> and Jews were excluded from the press and from the theater, and uh, Jews had to wear the yellow star for the first time in Hungary. And there were other restrictions, I won't go into a detail. What the Germans were interested in is for the deportation of the Jews to Auschwitz. So the deportation process, the master plan called for the concentration uh, of all Jews in the provinces in uh, temporary ghetto-like stations, in centers with adequate rail facilities to make possible swift entrainment and deportation with the Hungarian gendarmerie and police officials forcing the Jews to surrender their valuables. As the Eichmann SS team was relatively small, the massive arrest and deportation of the Jews was carried out by thousands of Hungarian gendarmes. The Jews of Northeast Hungary and Northern Transylvania were to be deported first between May 15 and June 11. The deportations proceeded with swift precision. As people were awakened by the Hungarian gendarmes at the crack of dawn, given only a few minutes to pack essential clothes and any food they happened to have in the house and taken <coughs> to uh, either their local synagogues where they were robbed of their money, jewelry, and valuables. <coughs> then, after a few days, they were marched to the nearest assembly points, normally brickyards, glass factories, lumber yards, farms, and pigsties. The deportation began on schedule on May 15, with each train carrying 3,000 Jews crammed 70 to 90 in each padlocked freight wa wagon. You can read more about this in Elie Wiesel's book, Night. A daily average of over 12,000 people were deported, totaling 434,000 to 437,000 between May 15 and July 8, a period of uh, seven to eight weeks mostly to Auschwitz, where most were gassed upon arrival. 
the whole countryside of Hungary had been cleared of Jews. And the final stage was set for the over 200,000 Jews remaining in Budapest. At this point, following the protest of uh, foreign leaders, Hungarian leader Miklos Hopti decided on July 7th to suspend further deportations now scheduled for the capital of Jews. But then on October 15, 1944, with the Russians already inside Hungarian soil, Hungarian le Hungarian, the Hungarian leader Hofti announced his country's exit from the war. However, the Germans had prepared themselves for this event, and that same day they installed the pro-Nazi cross, arrow cross, known as Nilash in the Hungarian, and its head, Ferenc uh, Shalasi, in power. And then, frenzied gang of Arab Cross youth immediately took to the streets and began a free-for-all spree of murder and looting, killing several hundred Jews on the first night of the coup, with many taken to the banks of the Danube, shot and dumped in the river. It is estimated that about 17,000 Jewish lives were lost to these marauding bands. Death marches towards the Austrian border officially began on November 8th in inclement weather, with many falling by the wayside. Those left behind in Budapest were moved out of their assigned Jewish homes, and some 63,000, eventually 70,000, were herded into 162 buildings in a designated ghetto, with the exception of some between 15 and 30,000 Jews who were protected by foreign diplomats, and they were moved in what is what's called an international ghetto. So you had a regular ghetto, the big ghetto, and an international ghetto. Of the international ghetto, about 7,800 were under the protection of Switzerland, about 4,500 of Sweden, 2,500 of the Vatican, 698 of Portugal, and over 100 to 200 of Spain. They had protective passes, should pass. In the meantime, the city came under siege from the advancing Red Army, who began an intermittent shelling, adding to the havoc, confusion, and mayhem. The Pesh side of the city, Budapest is like two parts, and the Danube flows in the middle. Uh, most people lived on the Pesh side, including the Jews. The Pesh side of the city was liberated on January 17, 1945, by the Red Army. The losses sustained by Hungarian Jews were stupendous about 564,000 victims. In Budapest, about 119,000 Jews survived, about 69,000 in the ghetto, 25,000 in the so-called international ghetto, and an estimated 25,000 were hiding in Budapest. An additional 25,000 uh, survived the camps. Uh, that, that is, the people, those persons who were deported but they were not gassed, they were selected for labor, uh, or they were sent to labor camps, or they were sent to Austria to perform labor assignments, and 25,000 of these survived. Of significance in this tragic story is the effort by a team of diplomats to stem the avalanche of terror. Thanks to their superhuman efforts, tens of thousands of Jewish lives were spared. And we begin now with the story of Karl Lutz. He was one of the significant diplomatic rescuers in Budapest. He represented on behalf of Switzerland the interests of countries with no diplomatic ties with Hungary or at war with her. At the same time, he went out of his way to help thousands of Jews. In his capacity as also representing British interests, that included responsibility for the handling of immigration matters for Palestine, which was then ruled by Britain. He allowed a fellow Jew by the name of Miklos Kraus, Moshe Kraus, a Hungarian Jew who headed the Budapest branch of the Palestine Jewish Agency. He allowed him to work out, out of the additional Swiss legation building, uh, which was acquired for this pur purpose and is known as the Glass House. Now, it sounds a little bit confusing, all this. The thing is like this. The British uh, restricted immigration of Jews to Palestine, and, uh, but they allowed a certain number, a very limited number. 
And these people received 